students, in the previous lecture I talked about functional diversity of microorganisms that oxidize or reduce nitrogenous and sulfurous compounds along with some conversation on phototrophs that store or do not store sulfur. And as promised in this lecture we are going to talk about other chemotrophs other than phototrophs and other than the ones that process sulfur and nitrogenous compounds and including the ones that are interesting ones such as magnetic microbes and uh, we will deal with the remaining diversity in functions when it comes to bacteria. So, let us start first with dissimilative iron reducing bacteria. Now, even though it says here iron reducing bacteria, the important thing to note is that there this belongs to a class of bacteria that reduce metals or metalloids. And uh, here is a beauty, we have noticed that microbes that can reduce a certain metal can also reduce other metals. So, this is not very specific generally only to iron reduction. And this is one of the challenges in generating or designing a biomarker for iron reducing bacteria that iron reducing bacteria do not have very specific enzymes. Most of the enzymes can also reduce other similar metals or metalloids. And then the word here dissimilitative, we have talked about it before, this implies that the iron reduction is dissimilatory. So, once iron is reduced, it is not incorporated in the cell body of the microbe. The key genre are Geobacter and Chavanella. I must tell you here the little story about Geobacter. It was first discovered by a very famous scientist, Dr. Derek Lovely in Massachusetts. And this discovery along with many others shot him up to fame and uh, he is now one of the stalwarts of geo biogeochemistry which is biology of earth along with its interactions and chemistry. And um, there is lot of career prospects in applied environmental microbiology my dear students. So, do not be disheartened by people who say ah microbiology only for researchers. For example, this Dr. Derek Lovely is has been one of the richest persons in Massachusetts states in USA, even richer than the governor of Massachusetts, only by his research <laughs> in applied environmental microbiology. Alrighty, so let us look at dissimilative iron reducing bacteria. So, the key genre are Geobacter and Chavanella and they couple dissimilatory iron reduction with cellular growth. So, what it is saying is that as they reduce iron, they take their energy to grow the cells. They face the obstacle of using an insoluble solid material as an electron acceptor in respiration. Most of the microbes they actually need to bring in the electron acceptor into their bodies and that is where the respiration happens. However, iron as you have noted is not soluble in water and it is solid and many a times it exists like a metal. So, it becomes challenging for microbe on how they are going to reduce iron and they have come up with a very interesting many very diverse range of interesting approaches to using this insoluble solid material as electron acceptor. What they do is they externally reduce the metal and they take the electrons either directly into their cell, there is one geobacter that does that or they couple it with metal, uh, metal reduction with hydrogen oxidation. So, as iron is getting reduced, hydrogen is getting oxidized and remember hydrogen loves to get oxidized and then that energy from hydrogen oxygen is tapped by the energy um, carriers, energy molecules and brought into the cell. So, uh, many other organisms enzymatically reduce metals in their environment, but are unable to use this for cellular growth. Now, this is very important. There are other microbes that whose enzymes automatically reduce iron, automatically reduce other metals such as arsenic and uranium, but they do not use that energy, they cannot tap into that energy for cellular growth. So, this is how iron reducing bacteria are distinct from those microbes that can reduce iron or that can reduce other metals. So, if you cannot tap into a reduction of metal as energy source then you are not a metal reducing bacteria, you reduce it by default uh, quite passively without any benefit from that process. Alrighty, as I mentioned before, dissimilatory iron reducers couple metal reduction with hydrogen oxidation so as to bring the energy inside the body, inside the cell and they are phylogenetically very diverse. So, remember this means they are found in different phyla and genetically they are very diverse, but functionally note they are all very similar. So, they are under the same functional uh, category, but genetically they are very diverse. They are common in anoxic freshwater and marine sediments, deep surf surface and shallow aquifers. And the little work that I have done with iron reduction um, was in sediments of shallow aquifers. Alrighty, so 
V iron can be reduced, it can also be oxidized. So, desimilatory or desimilative iron oxidizing bacteria, the key genera are Acidithiobacillus and Gallionella. Um, they are found with, with within 5 bacterial phyla and 2 archaeal phyla. So, these are just key genera, there are many more. Uh, by key genre, it implies if you hear these Gallionella, ah, oh, iron oxidizing bacteria, it should ring a bell. What they do is they couple oxidation of ferrous iron with cellular growth and they are believed to have been one of the first metabolic pathways when uh, life was evolving on earth. They are strongly influenced by pH and oxygen level, so they are very sensitive to oxygen. You can imagine why if oxygen is present with ferrous iron and the pH is right, then the oxygen will chemically oxidize it and not allow the iron oxidizing bacteria to gain that energy, trap into that energy for cellular growth and sustenance. So this is ferrous spontaneously forms, by spontaneously we mean chemically. So, the energy uh, gives free energy drives the chemical reaction and it forms insoluble precipitates of ferric at neutral pH in presence of oxygen. But if there is no oxygen then it is stable and iron oxidizing bacteria can do their job. So, yeah. Or if oxygen is present then the pH should be really low for ferrous to be stable and iron oxidizing bacteria to be able to do their job. Now, look here. So, aerobic low pH where can we have this? In one of the previous lectures, I mentioned about acid mine drainage. So, when we are mining, we are exposing these metals to oxygen that have not been exposed to oxygen in a long time. So, they are in a reduced form. So, let us say red ferrous instead of ferric and the sulfur in them, if let us say it is ferrous pyrite, if it has get, if it is oxidized to sulfate, it will produce sulfuric acid and then the pH will drop. So, now we have low pH and we have aerobic conditions. And in this case, iron oxidizing bacteria can kick in and what we generate is beautiful colors in acid mine drainage uh, rivers that in surface water that is affected by acid mine drainage. Uh, iron oxidizing bacteria can be classified into four groups on basis of their physiology. So, they can be acidophilic aerobic iron oxidizers, we just talked about them. In fact, if it has to be aerobic, they have to be acidophilic, otherwise the chemistry will drive the iron oxidation. Neutrophilic aerobic iron oxidizers, very rare. Anaerobic chemotrophic iron oxidizers, anaerobic phototrophic iron oxidizers. The other kind of distinct chemotrophic bacteria we want to talk about are hydrogen metabolizing bacteria. So, the key genera are Ralstonia and Paracoccus. Now, notice here hydrogen metabolizing bacteria, you can imagine they are oxidizing hydrogen because hydrogen is extremely electronegative. What it means is that it wants to give electrons away. On the other end, we have oxygen which is extremely electropositive. And the ability to conserve energy in this way using hydrogen is found widely in tree of life. What it is implying is that these are uh, phylogenetically very diverse. So, they are not just limited to Ralstonia and Paracoccus, but they are found in many, many different types of um, microbes, many different phyla. It occurs virtually in every genus of anaerobic archaea. <laughs> they are phylogenetically so diverse if we map uh, archaea and we point out the anarchia, sorry, anaerobic archaea in almost every genus and genus is pretty fine, you know. Um, we will find hydrogen metabolizing bacteria. The equation looks like this, hydrogen reacts with oxygen, forms water and we have a delta G prime naught of minus 237 kilojoule which is pretty substantial. They have great metabolic diversity. Now, look at this beauty. Not only do they have great phylogenetic diversity, but they have great metabolic diversity. Obvious question should be, well, all of them are metabolizing hydrogen. Then how come they have great metabolic diversity? Well, if um, we look into different kinds of hydrogen bacteria, that is who metabolize hydrogen, we note that they can couple up with different kinds of electron um, acceptors and they are not necessarily always, it, it is not necessarily always Arabic. And in that sense, they have a very diverse metabolism and collectively they are referred to as hydrogen bacteria. They best grow under low oxygen, so micro aerophiles 5 to 10 percent and why? Because like nitrogenase, their major enzyme hydrogenase is sensitive to presence of oxygen. So, less oxygen is better for them. They are not as sensitive as nitrogenase, but they are pretty sensitive. They need nickel. So, if you are growing hydrogen bacteria in lab, your media should have nickel in it. And because the hydrogenase, uh, uh, an essential component of hydrogenase is nickel. Alrighty. So, next kind of bacteria we want to talk about is methanotrophic and methylotrophic. 
Now both bacteria are very very common in subsurface when you go way beneath the earth and try exploring the soil microbial community there and usually uh, it is oil and natural gas companies that are more interested in this but it is very interesting uh, domain uh, for avenue for research and applied environmental microbiology anyway. So methylotrophy, so they use compounds that have two carbon, remember uh, methane one carbon but when we are talking about methyl so this carbon is attached to some other carbon. So, they have two carbon bonds and uh, they are um, they that is what serves as electron donors again they are pretty diverse phylogenetically. Now, these are very big broad uh, phylum proteobacteria for example has a, is in itself phylogenetically very diverse for example, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, epsilon proteobacteria are very different from each other and within themselves there have been a lot of differences. Firmicutes again very diverse, actinobacteria, bacteroidetes, vermicom microbiobia and archaeal uroarchaeota. So, very diverse phylogenetically. The ones that are aerobic, they are prevent, prevalent in soil and aquatic system. Obviously, the ones that are anaerobic would be found, anaerobic would be found way in down deep in the oceans and seas, so in marine systems. Many anaerobic ones are methanogenic archaea, this is very interesting. So, methylotrophs who use double uh, 2C, car, uh, 2C chemicals as their source of electron produce methane. So, they use this as source of electron and they reduce it to methane. So, 2 carbon uh, compound becomes 1 carbon methane and energy is generated that energy is tapped in. So, additionally sometimes sulphate reducing bacteria and methanogenic, methanogenic archaea combine to oxidize methane from gas hydrate found in deep sea sediments. Oh, this is very different th thing happening and this is also a recent discovery actually. We know now that methanogenic archaea the ones that produce methane and there is already plenty of methane present in gas hydrate. They will couple up with the sulphate reducing bacteria. So, there will be met, uh, sulphate oxidation of methane and energy will be generated and this energy is used by both microbes to survive. And because otherwise um, methane uh, um, in this circumstance sulphate uh, reduce reduction and methane oxidation the delta G is not um, the delta G and the energy barrier together are not feasible enough for this reaction to happen unless they make this consortium. Methanotrophs are a subset that consume methane gas. So, if uh, they only consume methane gas and not other carbon uh, sources that fall under methyltrophy, then they are called as methanotrophs. Remember, trophy means eat, what do you eat? And methane, you eat methane. Alrighty, the other kind of distinctive chemotrophic bacteria that we are interested in are acetic acid bacteria and acetogens. Now, many microbes what they do is they produce acetate as a byproduct. So, if there is an incomplete sulphate reduction happening, there is incomplete iron reduction happening or often in case of fermentation we will have acetate as a byproduct and then nobody wants to use acetate. So, microbes that create acid, acetic acid as their byproduct or sometimes as their primary product of metabolism are called as acetic acid bacteria. They usually fall under acetobacter and gluconobacter. So, look at even the names of these microbes will give you an idea of what they are about acetobacter. They usually include obligate aerobes and these are used for um, industrial production of acetic acid and they also include acetogens which are obligate anaerobes. So, they look here even acetic acid bacteria and acetogens are um, metabolically very diverse. They can be obligate aerobes, they can be obligate anaerobes, can't survive without oxygen, can't survive with oxygen and they use acetyl coenzyme A pathway to produce acetate. In this case the key genera would be acetobacterium, look here again aceto and clostridium. Most clostridium FYI are anaerobic microbes. Alrighty, now this is where things get very interesting for you I hope. Now we are going to talk about predatory bacteria. So far we have talked about bacteria who actually utilize the chemicals around in their environment and the light, the energy sources in their environment and they tap into this to uh, drive biochemical reactions which will give them energy and which will give them carbon. But now we have microbes that actually prey and live off other microbes. So, this is hunting and prey, predator prey model for microbes. Let us look into it. The first we are going to talk about predatory bacteria which literally go and attack a bacteria, kill it and eat it. Now, 
there are three kinds of predatory bacteria. First is epibiotic bacteria. What they do is they attach to the surface of the prey. So they come in this slug, snug, uh, they come in they attach to it like leeches attached to higher order of life. Like if you get a leech, leech will leech out the blood of your body. Similarly, epibiotic pr uh, predators, they attach to the body, they acquire nutrients from the cytoplasm or from the periplasm. So if you remember, in many microbes, we have cellular membrane, then we have periplasmic membrane. And between cell cellular membrane and periplasmic membrane, we have periplasm. So sometimes they don't uh, just stay outside the cell wall, but they enter it and they stay in the periplasm and they suck out all the nutrients from cytoplasm. Eventually, they lyse the cell, they kill it, and in that process, they have multiplied, they have grown. These are epibiotics. So epi means outside, bio means life. So they stay on the outside of life. They'll stay on the cellular membrane or cell the cell wall or in some cases within periplasm, but still they're outside the cell. Then we have cytoplasmic predators. They actually go inside and live inside the cell. So they invade the host, cell, host cells and they replicate within, they consume the prey to literally from inside out. Some examples are Daptobacter and Delo Vibrio. We'll be talking about Delo Vibrio a little bit more in detail. And I hope this interests you. Epibiotic predator, one of the examples is Vampirococcus. Very vampire like in nature. The mythical vampire bites the prey and then sucks the blood out, which is what epibiotic predators do. Then we have social predators. These are really cool predators. They cool in sense they have very complex and very complicated lifestyle and life cycle. They glide, they move in swarms and when we talk about moving in swarms, it appears as if all these unicellular microbes, when they move together in a herd or in a swarm, they act as if they are one single organism. So even then th this implies they have really good communication with each other. And in microbes, when they communicate with each other, please note, it's called as quorum sensing. So they're sensing how many people are present, how many of them are from my community, they are my kind of bacteria and what's going on. So they can communicate with each other using these chemicals. This is called quorum sensing. So they use this quorum sensing and this swarming behavior which is moving in herds together as if it's one singular organism to find our prey. And once, let's say, one of the social predator finds out, oh, this is a prey here, the entire swarm will gather around it, and then they release enzymes that will lyse the prey, and then they collectively uh, feed off the prey. Example are lysobacter, and lysobacter, as the name suggests, it lyses the other cells, and my, so, uh, myxococcus, and we'll be talking about myxococcus a little bit more in detail. So let's first talk about Delovibrio. These are cytoplasmic predators, which means they're epibiotic predators. They uh, want to leech off the. I'm sorry. They're cytoplasmic predators, which implies that they uh, actually uh, uh, eat the cell inside out. Now, delo means leech. So the name suggests it's like a leech vibrio. They're highly motile and they're curved bacteria. So they're curved in shape. They're highly motile. They move really fast. They obligate aerobes. They need oxygen. They attach to the prey cell. They penetrate the cell wall of the prey. They replicate in the periplasmic space, forming a spherical structure called deloplast. And they can attack gram-negative bacteria. Why and not gram-positive? Why is that so? You can expect this question in the homework. Why can they only attack gram-negative bacteria and not gram-positive? Now, here's a cool thing. For delovibrio, Predation is not an obligatory lifestyle. They can actually act like a chemotroph. They don't need to pred uh, hunt and invade a cell. And they're widespread in aquatic habitat. So let's take, let's take a while and let's look at the life cycle of Delovibrio when it has chosen a predatory lifestyle. So let's say this is a cell, the prey. And usually Delobacteria are very small compared to their prey. And as mentioned, they are um, curved. And they're highly motile, they have this whip-like structure that move, helps them move very fast. So they will attach to the outer membrane of the cell. And then the next step is they will enter the periplasmic space. So this is the periplasmic space. They'll enter the periplasmic space. So here they have entered. And they will start leaching off the cytoplasm. They start consuming the cytoplasm. And what they will do is eventually they form a deloblast around it. So they make a different pocket here. So now within the periplasmic space, we have two things. We have cytoplasm covered by cellular membrane and we have delovibrio covered by deloblast. And then here also there will be a deloblast. So as it leaches off more and more nutrients from cytoplasm, it elongates, it grows longer. So you can see the delovibrio has grown so long. And the next step would be it 
it leaches off everything it can from the cytoplasm and then it breaks into new delo vibrio and the cytoplasm is gone and then the next this is lysis step internal lysis of cell and the next thing we know that the cell has disappeared and we are left with new delo vibrio now it can choose to go for chemotrophy or depending on the situation it can choose a predatory lifestyle The next example is social predator myxobacteria. Now this has a very complicated lifestyle, one of the most complicated lifestyle among all bacteria. When they are under starvation, which is when they don't have good food or in good nutrients available, they aggregate into this huge elaborating, elaborate fruiting body. So when they aggregate, they form heaps of myxobacteria and then from these heaps emerge the elaborate fruiting bodies. So here notice. Let us look at the picture. These are fruiting bodies. If you can look at the right panel, so initially a heap is formed. It looks like a heap of um, mud uh, of myxobacteria and then from them these elaborate fruiting bodies emerge and within them they divide into myxospores. So these are myxospores here and these can survive for years <laughs> under really bad conditions. So they are not as stable as uh, spores of bacteria but they are pretty spores pretty stable. Okay, now let us talk about social predators and these are uh, myxobacteria is actually an example of social predator. Vegetatives, their, their vegetative cells are simple and non-flagellated. So if you look at myxobacteria here, it is non-flagellated and it is pretty simple. They glide across in swarms, so remember the swarming behavior and they obtain nutrients primarily by using extracellular enzyme to lyse the bacteria. It excre excretes slimes as it moves. So when these social predators they move, they leave a slime trail. So if you look at a sn um, some snail moving, you can see a slight trail of wetness that follows it. So they leave a slime trail. They form a swarm that exhibits self-organization, which is really neat. So they behave as a single coordinated entity in response to environmental cues. And people believe that this is the origin of multicellular life forms. When nutrients have exhausted, they are in a scarcity or um, and then what will happen is vegetative cells will move towards each other. So this is where they use their quorum sensing, they aggregate, they form heaps and then this, from these heaps emerge fruiting bodies. So these fruiting bodies, they form myxospores. So you see here they are beginning to form heaps and here they have uh, made, they made a heap here and from heap emerge this fruiting body and this fruiting body has specialized into myxospores. Now these myxospores, um, they are resistant to drying, UV and heat but not as resistant as endospores of some other bacteria and from here when the nutrients are available again, when life is more sustainable again, they can fruit and form more, um, more of the bacteria. The other example that I want to talk about is Legionella pneumophila because it is very relevant when it comes to public health. And Legionella pneumophila is an issue for environmental engineers and environmental scientists because we notice that in our water systems, let us say our indoor plumbing environment, depending on the water flow, depending on the water chemistry, depending on the nutrients that we are supplying or that are present in the water, the conditions might be ideal for Legionella pneumophila to grow in our biofilms of our drinking water system. Now, Legionella pneumophila typically requires warm temperatures, so it's, it either has to be hot climate like India or other equatorial tropical places or it has to be a hot environment such as in water heaters. So what Legionella pneumophila will do is, it enters into an amoeba. So um, it enters, so this is an environment and this is Legionella pneumophila, it has entered here and it can either stay in the protozoic or free floating form and, and go back to the drinking water or it can invade the biofilms. Once it has invaded the biofilm, what it does is it, it, it is eaten up by an amoeba. So the, if there is an amoeba present, the right amoeba present in the biofilm, it will eat the Legionella pneumophila but it is not able to destroy this bacteria. and then this bacteria, it will eat the amoeba from inside out. So what it does is it replicates within the bacteria, it consumes its nutrients until it is so strong that it will lyse the amoeba and then we have multiple copies of Legionella spread. So this is a very important uh, diagram and I want you to be very clear about this. Again in, um, in this, when we grow Legionella in lab, we notice there are two growth phase, exponential and stationary and both morphologically are slightly distinct. 
Now, this brings us to morphological diversity of bacteria. So, this is a picture that I showed you in one of the first lectures and this is from human gut. So, my scientists took human gut microbes and they tried seeing it under microscope and this is definitely a false color image. So, they were colored later, initially microscope saw it black and white. But notice if within one environment we have such diversity in morphology, we have big rounds, we have here elongated cylinders, we have rods and we have different, uh, well we have made it different colors, but we also have cocas, spheres, balls, some of them stick, some of them do not and we have this dumbbell shape kind of microbe and then we do not see many, but in human gut we also have some filamentous. So, we notice even in a very small snapshot, now imagine this is a very small part of human gut. So, in a very small snapshot we have quite some diversity of morphology. And we know we again from one of the first few lectures that there is immense diversity in morphology and there is a reason behind this diversity because each of these decides how uh, suitable microbe is for living in the environment. So, depending on morphological diversity of bacteria, let us go through them. First is pyrochetes. This is very interesting bacteria uh, because um, it, it, uh, it moves in a very different way. Its motility is not driven by your typical ATP synthase kind of motor. In fact, uh, these are gram negative and they are tightly coiled bacteria and uh, they contain endoflagella. So, they do have flagella, the whip like structures, but they are inside them and they have a common sheath. Now, these um, endoflagella, they, when they move in the same direction, the micro moves in the other direction, thus creating a torque and this torque propels the spirochetes outside. They run into eight genre based on habitat, their pathogenicity, phylogeny, morphology and physiology. Now, here I mentioned pathogenicity, so spirochetes, some of them cause diseases and one of them causes syphilis, which is a sexually transmitted disease in humans. And then the, there is another microbe called spirilla, which also looks like a spiral like a spring and is often confused to be a spirochete. But there is a big difference between the two. They do not have an outer sheet, they do not have endoflagella and they do not have this cox screw like motility and I will talk about what this cox screw motility is. Spirilla unlike spirochetes are typically rigid cells and they divide terminally and they can form long helical filaments. So, uh, let us let us look into the movement of spirochetes. Alrighty students, so this is uh, a cartoon of spiral sheet, a typical spiral sheet. It is very hard to draw a spiral. So, I have just drawn a curvy model of a microbe and I hope you can imagine in your mind that this is actually a spiral microbe. And if we look at it, if we make a, uh, if we cut it here like this radially, we will see something like this. So, it is um, a cross section would look something like this. There is an outer sheet which is black in color and you, you rest are visible from outside and this is a flexible outer sheath. Inside is the actual cellular membrane which is quite rigid actually and here on the outer sheet you will notice at polar ends we have endoflagellum. So, these are in, in uh, endo, so they are inside the cell, they are inside the outer sheet and they are used for motility, for movement. Now, when the endoflagellum move and in the same direction they create a motion in this direction in this flexible outer sheath. At the same time, the inner sheath it moves in the opposite direction and thus they create a torque and this torque is what allows it to move in a corkscrew like motion. So, a corkscrew um, when you screw, screw the screw nails inside the uh, wood or inside the wall, it moves like this and it goes in and this is how they go in and thus uh, and unlike uh, the other spirilla that we talked about they are the only bacteria who can have this corkscrew like motion. 
all right a. Now next are morphologically diverse again budding bacteria the key genera are hyphomicrobium and colobacteria. Now budding is budding bacteria are those bacteria that when they divide they do not undergo the typical binary fission. So if you remember we learned that in typical binary fission uh, we have cells and they produce two of everything and then they divide into two equal daughter cells. But in budding we have unequal cell growth. So, we can say that the parent stays intact and a daughter buds out. The other difference between budding and binary fission is that in binary fission we have two of all enzymes, two of the genetic material, but in budding the daughter cell has to de novo synthesize some enzymes. And this is one of the advantage for budding uh, microbes because they can it is easier to de novo synthesize certain complex enzymes than to make two of them and separate them. Alrighty. So, cell wall material is and the another difference is the cell wall material in budding bacteria here budding bacteria are formed from a singular point. But in cell division in binary fission the entire cell membrane participates into it. Internal structures such as membrane complexes are not partitioned. So, remember membrane complexes and cytoplasm membrane they are not partitioned here and must be synthesized de novo. And most of them are uh, phototrophic, chemolithotrophic and they contain extensive internal membrane system. And because they have such extensive internal membrane system, it is very hard to replicate it and, and make bud in, uh, break into two daughter cells. So, they prefer budding and then the new daughter cell will produce its own um, extensive internal membrane system de novo. So, this is another picture of budding bacteria. Notice from one point the cellular membrane shoots out, new nucleoid to new. So, this genetic material has replicated into two. The genetic material moves in here, the new nucleoid moves into the bud. This is the young bud, and the nuclear material is ready and it separates. So, it still does not have the complex internal membrane proteins that this, mem this has, and it, but it will, it has enough information to generate them de novo. Next we have prosthecate and stalk bacteria. So, there are certain bacteria that can produce stalks, hyphae and appendages that help it to attach. They, these extrusions are unique because they have smaller diameter than the main body of the cell, but they still have cytoplasm and cell wall. So, there is another advantage because they still have the cytoplasm and the cellular membrane, they increase the surface area to volume ratio. They allow cell to attach and increase surface area to volume ratio. There may be an adaptation to oligotrophic lifestyle of many of these bacteria. So, we will see this more in the drinking water systems when attachment is required and also when they want to increase the surface area to volume ratio so that they can have more surface for nutrients to come in. And they may also be helpful for reducing cell sinking if you increase the surface. then the upward thrust of the water will be more. So, this is important when the cells are aerobic and aquatic and they need to stay afloat. If they sink down then they will go in anaerobic zones. And these are other example pictures showing the same thing already. Now, in sheath bacteria we have oh, this is a very interesting bacteria. They are cells that grow in one terminal they form long filaments and multicellular filaments and they have one outer sheath. So, if you look at under microscope you will see one long cylinder, but inside these cylinders there are multiple cells. So, it will look something like this. So, we have one long sheath and inside these sheaths we have multiple cells. Alrighty, under favorable circumstances they will grow long cell packed sheets, under unfavorable circumstances they break away and they disperse to find more suitable environment. Now bioluminescence, this is really cool, look at this picture, these microbes are glowing in the dark and most marine, deep marine organisms require this bioluminescence. The other kind of animals who require bioluminescence are animals who are deep sea animals, so they need light, they have no light source to see to be visual and uh, what they have in their light organs like what we have eyes as a light organ, they have this bioluminescent bacteria that glow and how they glow? They use this gene Lux CDABE, this gene encodes for the enzyme that is required for glowing in dark and we have exploited this luciferase for creating some marvelous um, technologies in microbiology. Then we have magnetic bacteria. These are really neat. They have these uh, magnetosomes which are cell parts that contain magnetite or gregite, both are forms of iron that are magnetic in nature and because of this they tend to move and align themselves along the north south pole of earth. And 
there is a hypothesis that this alignment with north south pole of earth allows them to stay in the zones that are low oxygen so it's like a compass that directs them where to go where not to go because their body automatically will align in the north south direction and if there is some magnetic mineral around they will get attached to it they are typically micro aerophilic and anaerobic they don't like oxygen so this is all for today and in the next lecture we will continue and we'll talk we'll talk about ecological diversity we'll talk about the eco microbial ecology in different environments and um, and that's all for functional diversity on bacteria thank you very much